Broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light across the vast chasms of space, streaming directly into your brain, you're listening to the Spartacast League, and I am Phelan, and joining us today are Attica and a new host, Reconcile. So get ready, strap in to tonight's topic, toxic masculinity, and how it infected our lives and our body politic. But first, I wanted to share a clip a friend of the show and former Coast to Coast AM host Ian Punnett shared with me back in December of a peanut farmer from Alabama protesting Roy Moore. The first time I heard this clip, I was brought to tears. It is of a man who is deeply remorseful, and it is this clip that reminded me why we fight against homophobia, sexism, and toxic masculinity. My name is Nathan Mathis. My daughter was Patty Sue Mathis. This her right there. Judge Roy Moore called her a P-bird on one reason, because she was gay. If he called her a P-bird, he called your child a P-bird if she was gay, or your son was gay. This is something people need to stop and think about. You're supposed to uphold a constitution. The constitution said all men are created equal. Well, how's my daughter? pre-birth just because she was gay. Does it mean she was born gay? I don't know the answer to that. But she was gay. There she is. Are you a man of faith? Am I a man of faith? Yes. And I am. Being out here tonight, what do you hope to accomplish? I don't know what I'll accomplish. I really don't. I had mixed emotions about coming, but somebody needs to speak up. And if it's all to no avail, so be it. It won't be the first time I've done something to no avail, okay? How far have you done? But my it? sign there speaks for itself, and my sign is true. Sir? How far of a drive was this for you? It's, I'm only about 15 and 20 miles away. I was born here in Midland City. So are you suggesting that the suicide of your daughter was because of. No, I'm not like suggesting. I'm not suggesting that. I was anti-gay myself. I said bad things to my daughter myself, which I regret. But I can't take back what happened to my daughter. But stuff like saying my daughter's a pre-bird, sure, I'm sure that bothered her. Now, you know, Judge Moore not just said my daughter. He didn't call my daughter by name. He said all gay people are pre-birds. Abominations. That's not true. We don't need a person like that representing us in Washington. That's why I'm here. Ma'am, I don't remember the, remember the year. It's been a, let's see. I'll be totally wrong. Right now I'm cold and nervous too. Sorry. God, they're just so heartbreaking. I know. I, the reason that I wanted to share that is because, you know, that is the voice of a person who has realized that he had made a huge mistake in judging other people's and those judgments had tangible consequences on his life and the life of other people i think it really takes this kind of consequence to really teach people how to look outside of themselves like, you can't just have these attitudes and consider them, like, harmless opinions. You know, it's not just, oh, these are your beliefs. No. People are wrecked by this. People are, lives are ruined. You know? Uh, and, and you don't always see it until it's too late. Like, in this case, I'm sure that, you know, they may or may not have had arguments. She may or may not have tried to advocate for himself. But, like, at the end of the day, this happens. You know, it's been, it was happening, you know, in, inside her. And ultimately, it came to, you know, this terrible conclusion. So let me just, for the sake of people listening, ask the question, what does this have to do with toxic masculinity? Because there are a lot of people who are going to chime in and say, oh, well, that's a gay rights issue. That doesn't have anything to do with, you know, being masculine or whatever. So if, if you could connect those two for our listeners, Mr. Fox. Yeah, so one of the major factors behind homophobia is this idea that men are afraid 
of being treated like women and that's how they see homosexuality they see it as as a way that they could potentially be treated as a woman and that's just one of the many different factors that's involved in that equation right and then that's obviously tied into gender roles how gender roles um, are played out what people how people look at those who don't fit into those gender roles and you know the the way that they treat them the way that they think about them and that's toxic masculinity is i guess like a, an archetype of that whole gender role judgment and then there's also you know obviously the way that women fit into that and the way that homosexuals fit into that kind of ties together this also explains one of the big things i know it's sort of a de beating a dead horse but it's it's probably going to be something that's talked about for years to come even though they're pretty much dead and gone now <clears throat> but alt furry always tried to make this connection we're gay but we're m masculine gay we're normal gay we're not like we're gay and they, they kept trying to drive that spike through it to try to put like this manly kind of gay on the side of not being treated like a woman i guess as a way to like maybe it was had some the inkling of wow our ideology doesn't make sense given who we are but it that does explain a lot of like oh well you know they wanted to still be gay but like not be treated like women or have people think that they're treated like women and honestly like god what year are they thinking in 53 bc that's what year in I'm 53 bc the romans were having like crazy off the wall sex parties where like being gay didn't matter are you kidding me yeah but they don't put that into total context and they vapped the fucking like roman sexuality but half of them don't even freaking understand it <laughs> but like this is this is an extension of the alt-right to begin with so what alt furry is doing their talking points and everything was the same thing that the alt-right was doing in general people like milo and whatnot right milo and they're really trying queenier to than me like who is he fooling that uh snow leopard milo oh god that was made by a guy who made a really popular furry comic and i'm really embarrassed he also, like, quite literally, that guy threw a fit because comic stores wouldn't carry his comic in actual physical stores, and he thought it was because they were all SJWs. <laughs> literally, he put this on his Twitter. Yeah, and that's another thing. Alt-Right and alt Frey, just, their whole war is a war of trying to shape this narrative and pin all this responsibility on left-wing, making them out to be, you know, the antagonist. I mean, you see it right now in the, um... The government shutdown where the republicans are saying oh you know this is all the democrats fault just like through and through the right wing is trying to like reshape this narrative you know with false equivalencies etc etc and that ties into toxic masculinity as well because one of the main conditions apparently of being a man is that you're rarely ever at fault for anything it's usually always someone else's fault unless it happens to fall on this really narrow like honor system and then you like have to trek out into the woods and disappear or go under the forge and wait to die or something the big the biggest the biggest thing you can be guilty of is showing feelings and of course that kind of brings us to this whole issue that men actually do lose out because of toxic masculinity in life in their mental health it causes so much mental health issues simply because they don't have a means to, to vent or whatever. If they're feeling anxious or if they're depressed or whatever, they're told that if they reveal this, that they are exposing some sort of weakness. I wonder if the whole guns as a toy culture thing that has developed in that circle is the only emotional outlet that they have like the only time they can feel emotion is when they're shooting a gun at something perhaps uh, i mean i don't know <laughs> definitely that and there's a lot of like trying to feel power that is tied into the idea of masculinity especially in our western culture actually i think both of those points bring up a really interesting study that was done at indiana university bloomington so it was a study where they looked at 
how conformity to masculine norms and mental health related outcomes actually impacted the psychology of the men who were embodying those attitudes. They uh, listed a bunch of norms that are generally considered by experts, and I'm quoting uh, APA.org here, um, we'll include the link, but they looked at some norms, um, for instance, desire to win, need for emotional control, risk-taking, dominance, playboy um, attitudes, so sexual promiscuity, and power over women, etc. There are a few others. And it turned out in this meta-analysis that they did that there were a couple of these norms that were just really, really destructive to the psychologies of the men who were embodying them. And that was power over women and um, trying to be playboys. So this whole idea of expressing power and dominance in you know, gender relations really has a toxic impact on obviously the women but also the men who are engaging in this and that's interesting because it says you know it's not a zero-sum game um there are damages done to both parties uh, it's, it's just despite the fact that women suffer more men are also suffering and like why would you want that kind of framework why would you want that world where we have these religious adherence to these norms well like None of them will be the first to say that we should give it up because immediately they'll be accused of being gay. It's it's a box that they trap themselves in that they that they can't get out unless they all give themselves permission to get out. But it's always the other guy's job to make sure his friend ain't being gay. I mean, they ain't stepping out of that box, and it's I I don't I don't know how to get out of it how they would get out of it because they sure as hell won't listen to us because that would make them super duper gay if they were to listen to someone outside of that masculinity box right that's a really good point when you get trapped by these kinds of ideologies and it's really the only way out is to accept a kind of humility and to listen to people outside of yourself and to just recognize that you know your instinct let's say or your uh even if not instinct in a biological sense but this attitude that's been culturally embedded in you is something that you have to recognize, be conscious of, and work against. You know, you're conditioned to be like this, and you have to, if you want to escape that box, you have to examine yourself and actually, as the privileged person here, undo and kind of tease apart the complications of those norms. So when your self-worth is just entirely tied into dominance and power and obtaining those kind of things when you fail at it then that definitely does have a deep effect on the psyche and of course within our society not everybody's going to be wealthy and on top that's how the system's designed so what ends up happening especially when you have economic crises like we could have in the future and like we had you know like 10 years ago something like that were to happen today you see this having a huge effect on the psyche of men and what it results in it results in a world where men take their lives because they feel that they are worthless because they can't provide for their family they can't provide for themselves and sometimes it's not even being able to provide. Sometimes it's just not getting that promotion if they're already, you know, well to do. It's so tied to conquest, conquest of money, conquest of women, conquest of property, conquest of the environment, that what happens when you run out of stuff to conquest or fail at that conquest? It's so tied to your house of cards of, of an identity that when you fail, it just comes crashing down. And you're already in a box, so you can't, you can't show any feeling about it, and you can't take any feeling input about it, least of all from a woman, especially not from another man. So you're isolated in what you see as this ultimate failure. Yeah, and, and then the thing that is most depressing about this, about being placed into this box is not only is you, are you losing out on health, but you're just losing out on, on life in general because you're always being pushed this like bullshit lifestyleism. You got to buy the manly product and everything. Like everything these days like has a manly freaking version of itself 
to sell to fragile men who just can't handle the idea of being closer in the same room as anything feminine. It's just like I, you know, like was going through these products and everything. One of them I saw was like a camo baby bag thing for diapers and stuff like that. And it's ridiculous. <laughs> I was, I was, I'm really honestly surprised. I haven't seen a full blown camo long haul big rig truck yet. I'm astonished. I have not seen that thing is that that kind of puzzles me about this camo baby bag thing is, is like the alt right are supposedly all about like, Oh, you got to be making babies and stuff like that. But you know, God forbid you actually hold your baby and enjoy the spend time with your kids. Cause you know, you got to be at work or you got to be at the bar, you know, with the bros, God forbid you actually take care of that family and spend time with them. Well, this is, this is something coherent on all right wing politics is that even, even without the Nazism and the weird, uh, fetishization of having white babies, they give a shit about whether you come out of the womb or not. They don't give a shit about whether you get sick or even make it to 18. And then when you're 18, they suddenly give a shit about you being old enough to send somewhere to go kill things. And then when you're not good at killing things anymore, cause you're too old, they don't give a shit. Yeah, just uh, from cradle to grave, it's exploitation. And like I was going back earlier, though, like with the the products and, and just having man versions of it, like it's so obnoxious, too. Uh, for instance, I saw man Kleenexes, like really. And my favorite one, I freaking saw like a can of yogurt with fucking abs. With abs. And what's funny about that is, um, I think Attica was saying this at uh, some other time, but this like masculine advertising program is a response to men thinking yogurt is feminine. And why is it that they think yogurt is feminine? Because of this advertising program where yogurt was marketed to women. It's just like this incredibly superficial and vacuous roundabout marketing scheme where companies are manufacturing interests in these products and managed to work that into gender norms based on, you know, what's profitable at the time. I guess like they realized that it would be easy to get uh, yogurt to women if they, you know, made it seem like, oh, you know, you'll be fit and this will be healthy for you. And they realized, you know, once it got, I don't know, you know popular with women, then they had to market to men now. And like to do that, they had to undo this, you know, marketing that's been done. It's just so, so pointless and vacuous. The entire thing is just, just comical, just to watch it go back and forth. Yeah, I'll never get over those like Ellen skits where she, uh, she like reviewed various products that are Bic, the pen, for her. You know, because pens are something that are masculine. Like, where is this coming from? Like, where are these? How do people manufacture these gender norms in their head? Like, do they actually believe that this is like something about their masculinity? Do they earnestly believe this? Or is it like some social game that they play? Like, I'm just, I don't get it as someone who doesn't play that game. I just, it, it mesmerizes me. I think Bic is, is doing something rather Freudy in there, and I don't even want to get into that. Uh, just break down the words for pen and pencil and trace it back to the Latin and you'll see. To chime in personally, I, I used to have this really big obsession, like most kids growing up, of seeming adult. Not like being taken seriously, but like not being that kid who has like a full out TV tray and some cinder block couches. My apartment, like, there, there's real furniture in it. It's all shit from Goodwill, but it, it's real furniture. Like, there's a television, there's a sofa, there's a sideboard, there's a wax melter, there's a record player. It's a fully fledged place to live. And I always thought, like, wow, this, you know, this, anyone who comes in is if you think, like, you know, I'm really put together well. I'm really. I, I know how to be an adult. I'm not, you know, I know how to assemble a livable home. And that was great. And then I invited friends over for the first time and their whole conversation was like, wow, you have like a grandma's apartment. And I was just like, that That just came completely off the wall. I expected it to be taken as, oh, this, he's really mature. But no, it was taken as in like, all my stuff is old and I give too much of a shit for, for having it. Oh, that's so irritating. 
And to this day, I don't understand why or, or where that came from or what I was, what I got wrong in my understandings and assumptions. It's, it's because there's also this whole part of masculinity that's tied in. Like you can't keep things too tight because if you take too good of yourself, you might be considered feminine. So you kind of got to half-ass it a little bit or you got to totally man that cave up. Speaking of half-assing, that reminds me of this discussion we were having the other night. Where well, men uh, aren't wiping their whole asses? <laughs> yep. Oh man, that I don't even I don't even know where to jump in with that because that was just such a so ripe with oh, ripe with dingleberries, man. So basically, we had ran across this story on Reddit. Well, I did uh, several months ago. I was discussing it with Attica and Reconcile the other day. Basically, it's men that aren't wiping their asses because they feel that it would make them gay because nothing can go between those cheeks. Yeah, it's like some of the quotes were there. Some of the quotes were there were saying they were women on Reddit saying that we're, you know, having they were just getting to know their male partners for real. They would, you know, talk about how they were just recently married, how they had been dating for a few months. One or two experiences would clue them in to the fact that their boyfriends or husbands were not, they literally weren't wiping their butts because they, they thought it was gay to have anything, even their own hands, even a piece of toilet paper enter between the cheeks. So they would end up, like, after sex, there'd be literal poop stains on the bed or in their underwear. And it was just, please, this is too far, masculinity, stop. Exactly. And when your tidy whities have more skid marks than a freaking NASCAR track, it is time to stop. Okay? It is time to stop. You need to get help. It's time to start, actually. <laughs> start wiping your ass. Please. I don't know what benefit people are getting out of this mindset. How is their life improved by believing that it's gay to clean your butt? <laughs> like... And could you just imagine, like, being married to these men? Like, what these women have to go through? Honestly, no. I don't I don't want to, but, like, oh, poor ladies. It, it's, it's really sad that, and maybe there is, I don't know, because I'm, uh, I'm not a woman. But I assume from the frequency that this is discovered by women, that there is not a conversation as they get married and leave the house that says, by the way... Your husband is not an adult. Your husband is a child. Your husband's mother was not allowed to continue his adult education because his father would not let him be feminized. And you are expected to teach your husband how to wipe his ass. I wish that was something that was just flat out said because women keep running into this issue. And I, that is it. That is because, you know, fathers won't let their wives teach their sons certain things because it would effeminize them. And so you get a grown ass adult who can't wipe his ass because it's so wrapped up in concepts of masculinity and sexuality. And then he dumps it on his poor wife as her issue. Then the wife has to basically finish raising what is essentially a man child at this point. This is not a functioning adult. I think it just exacerbates this, this whole problem, you know, with toxic masculinity and how it spreads in these sometimes just awkward and weird manifestations in our cultures or personalities or, or whatever. Toxic masculinity, it spreads between the cheeks. And speaking of other <laughs> vile... Is that too much? <laughs> yes. Now, speaking of, of other vile... I, I presume that you all heard that Chelsea Manning is, is running for Senate and the establishment liberals did the very predictable thing and accused her of being a Russian plant. Did you guys hear about this? Is that why my liberal friends are going off about that? Yes. Like, okay. No one, no one knew that WikiLeaks was this Russian thing when, I don't know, is it proper to say Bradley, considering she was Bradley when she, I'll just say Chelsea. So, you no, know, when Chelsea Manning did her thing and divulged the information to WikiLeaks, no one had any fucking idea it was a Russian thing. We didn't learn that until 2016. Least of all, probably did Chelsea. 
And the other thing no. is, is they they probably didn't have connections with Russia at that particular time. This no. whole Russian it, thing came about because of the election. And even then, it's questionable because WikiLeaks itself is a totally independent entity. They're not some. They're not a Kremlin front like everybody seems to think to believe they are. It wouldn't surprise me, though, if they did have connections, just like they have connections with a lot of government entities. Well, like, I can see why it's advantageous. You know, it undermined belief in the American justifications for the war, which fucking needed to be done, by the way. And yeah, I mean, I consider Julian Assange a complete traitor to the left. Of course. Of what he did during the election. I mean, you know, even if you don't like Hillary Clinton, he actively aided the the in installation of a fascist into the seat of the presidency. like For the, his own... His, yeah, for yeah. his own personal gain, too, because really the entire issue was him personally not liking Hillary Clinton and believing some of the more conspiratorial things about her. Oh, I also think he probably thought, because as documentaries have shown, as movies have shown, as books about his life have shown, he's got a pretty grandiose mind. He often thinks that he's bigger than he is. Now, he is very big and very capable. You know, he's not dead yet. He is holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy, but he hasn't been shot yet. He hasn't been assassinated. But I think he probably thought that he could have wiggled his way out of the charge that was keeping him there or gotten some kind of, you know, black helicopter passage out of that embassy. But, you know, no one was going to do anything for Julius. He was used like a tool. And the time for that is come and gone. And I doubt he'll be used again. But that's totally independent of what Chelsea Manning did in, what, 2013? Someone who, you know, her in the position that she was doing passing on information would not have any idea, would not even know, even if it was, there was an established link between Putin, the Kremlin, WikiLeaks, and Julian Assange. She, as someone who was passing information, would not be privy to that information whatsoever. Yeah, but I mean, at the end of the day, the people who are... What's really depressing is that the people... You know, looking at these stories are kind of looking for something sensational. They're looking for a narrative that, I guess, helps them feel comfortable with their establishment politics. And, like, if they can paint Chelsea Manning as this Russian radical, then you know, that's what they're going to do if it gets them, you know, more comfort with whatever establishment candidate they're looking at. They are. You know, it, it's a very convenient... I mean, I believe that Trump committed treason. I do believe that there was a Russian operation on the election. But it also very easily excuses in the liberal mind any potential fault with their management of the economy over the past eight years. To be able to pin everything, oh, all of this is happening because of the Russia. There's no underlying crisis of poverty. There's no big deal with income divides it's all russia and if we just solve that problem well then it all goes away and anyone who's still bringing up the problem after we make trump go away and russia go away well they're just russian spies and we know how to get rid of them exactly and it really isn't doing much to forward political solutions whatsoever like this whole Russian thing has really, in in my mind, it's it's been a red herring because there's n there's not been any political solution to come out of any of this other than finger pointing of treason, and there's plenty of finger pointing to go around, including towards Democrats themselves. So, it's best if this entire thing was either dropped or actual evidence is presented that is irrefutable because if they if the democrats are wrong about this if the democrats are not able to indict trump on the russia thing and he gets away with it the consequences are dangerous because that means he could win in 2020. that also sets a ridiculously dangerous precedent but there's no way there's no he, he is guilty of treason there is no way that there was not a Russian operation on the election. It's not all bullshit. And it, 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 it does need to be talked about. And I very much support the, the, the Mueller case and the FBI's investigations. 
that's a whole nother arena outside of what liberal Twitter has done with the whole thing, which is running around accusing anyone of bringing up any kind of underlying any other any underlying cause that even opened the vacuum for the possibility of Russian interference, massive poverty, un- unstable employment, high employment, but it's all in low paying jobs, so it's a wash anyway. Income. Um, distribution, lack of health care, lack of clean, non-lead-filled water in huge areas of this country. Liberal Twitter running around and accusing all those people of just Russian spies. Exactly. All, all the establishment left has done in this particular instance is every time somebody comes in with a solution on the left, they do... They just play the, oh, well, they're probably corrupted by the Kremlin game because the Kremlin's playing both sides here. It's ridiculous. I don't hear it coming from, quote, the establishment left. I hear it coming as an organic thing from liberal moms who don't want to admit that there is a serious underlying problem in America that wanted to all be Trump and Russia and you get rid of that and it's fixed and we can all go back to normal. I don't see it anywhere inside the strategy of the party. I see it as this sort of homebrew concoction of people who realize that they have to fight because their petty bourgeoisie rights are for the first time under threat. And they have the power and the time, the free time, to wage that war to preserve themselves. But afterwards, don't want to actually admit that there was a problem the whole damn time. No, That's where well, I see this. I don't see it in the actual politics. It's it's also liberal talking heads like Dave Rubin or establishment people like Debbie Schultz, etc. that are playing this uh, this accusation game as well. Every time that the Democrats have an opportunity to support somebody like Chelsea Manning or, you know, like that Virginian uh, Lee Carter as well, they, they always go towards the same talking point and just accuse the person of being a Kremlin troll without any evidence whatsoever to the but who's doing that is that is that is that the cavalcade of, of liberal mom twitter or does that actually come as party directive that that's my point here is that there's no con- c- controlling what's cooked up in liberal mom verse <laughs> what we can control is really going to be you know how we respond to it you know how we uh what kind of i guess social marketing we do as you know actual uh, leftists not even social marketing really god i just i just wish i could make every leftist read a fifth of what mal wrote because like there is the key are we serving the people i still don't like we're not we're not there yet we're not we don't the left does not have a shit together enough to have like mobile poverty relief squads right but like that's where we're gonna win the conversation if we're just on Twitter and we're just making stupid memes and we're just being cynical, then it, it becomes an easy back and forth. But it should be self-evident through our actions eventually at some point when we get our shit together enough that you want to call us just Kremlin agents, but like we're going out and we're fixing poor people's plumbing, right? It, it, that, that's where the politics need to be made real. That's a phenomenal point. I mean, really, like we really do need to lead by example, and we shouldn't be, we shouldn't need to be fighting a battle of rhetoric because people should just love what we're doing. That should, that's right. the whole point. Liberal soccer mom fundamentally does not have the time or the energy or the desire or the will to go out and fix poor people's problems. It's not within their ideology as a necessity, but it has a tradition on the left. But of course, that also relies on poor struggling people finding the 25th hour of the day to go and help someone else, help their neighbors, help someone who's poorer than them and trust me that's a struggle i work oftentimes 12 hours a day i am working i am working i am working and by the time i get home it's 10 o'clock and i still have to do like my mandatory life things that allow me to be a barely functional person to get up and go work and work and make money for someone else and i never have any money at the end of the day ever 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 and then it's so it's a huge task to ask people who are living like that but it's it has it has to be done. Otherwise, it does become a fight with rhetoric. And this country is conditioned 
to believe in words because they've never been shown anything like that. You know, the Democratic Party has never had a, a, a concept of serving the people in that Maoist sense. But Oprah can give a good damn speech. And if Oprah gives a good damn speech about why all these communists, why do they want to rock the boat? Well, you know, now you're fighting Oprah. Yeah, that's a really great point that you brought up about the fact that the people who would po- probably be have the energy and time are not the people who have the will and like the um, systemic understanding to implement the changes, but the people who then know what's up, the people who want to change the system and see why it's flawed, are the people who are so exploited that they don't have anything left to give. So it's this weird like limbo that we're in where we have to figure out how the hell the people who are like the most oppressed are going to somehow band together and stand against the system when like if you stop going to work for a few days like your life could very easily take a turn for the worse what is there to do and that i think is a really interesting question for the left to figure out because you know really these liberal politics and like also these top-down policies are all just so problematic like how do we generate that organic movement out of the people who are they get it and they also it would be a miracle if they had the energy to do that i do think that there is some some good actually starting to to bubble up here though because i mean we just saw yesterday and then today you know with the women's march millions of these soccer moms getting out they're they're on the streets having conversations with with radicals and hopefully there is going to be like some swing in this dialogue here and they doubled they doubled their they, they had more people out this year than they had last year so it is a growing movement now you know what i want to say is it's not they may they may join serve the people units it, like right now they are engaged in a war for their rights and their very existence as middle class moms and that's understandable justifiable i'll probably have tankies yelling at me but i support that because like i said the democratic party is not an existential threat to the people well you they have give a shit about them but it's not a, a threat it's not going to put them against walls and in camps but after they're done fighting that fight, half of them, yes, will probably go home and all troublemakers are just Russian spies. But the other half, they're engaged in a way that they've never been engaged before. And they'll probably feel quite an empty space once that's all over. They may see the, the benefit and the understanding that comes with actually continuing to be engaged and because they're the ones at the time and the time and the resources to actually be helping those poor people. Yeah, and I really do hope that it does actually change some minds here in these liberal soccer moms and get their point from listening to Dave Rubin and reading Andy Tubin and and the uh, New Yorker finally come to a realization that this isn't working and that eventually pretty much everything that they were given in life due to the mercy and that's what it is of the capitalist class to allow them to live the kind of lives that they did will eventually be taken away from them as the demand for ever more profit grows i don't know i mean i i would love to hope that these uh you know the liberals who are going to the feminist the women's march i would love to believe that they're going to be like side by side with these radicals have that transformative conversation where oh so it's it's not just about like wearing pussy hats we have to actually end capitalism granted like those conversations might occur but i am really skeptical that that is going to be the the mode by which this perspective comes across and i think that if we even look back at the beginning of this episode the whole discussion that was started with this peanut farmer whose daughter committed suicide that was an occasion where he had this set of beliefs and conversate i'm sure that like his daughter had conversations with him or if not that ideas probably you know through the quote-unquote liberal media got to him about you know why we should be respectful towards homosexuals their needs and like i i just i don't see that conversation occurring being the transformative element you know i don't see it as the um the catalyst I see the catalyst more as these events that, like, are these consequences to their beliefs, these 
actual realizations of what they are believing and saying and seeing how the impact is so destructive compared to these solutions that are being offered by you know the radical left i mean maybe it comes to i mean i don't know how to get to them you know do you make these mom do you force these moms to be friends with people in poor communities people in non-white communities and do you have them ultimately experience the suffering that comes with those life conditions what 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 do you do to make them see these the impact of their politics the key lies with our generation and specifically it lies with us i can already see the path of the future assuming that the liberals win will be a new liberal golden age where everything is great and they're not i don't i don't expect them to change trump's foreign policy i expect them to put a smiling face on it and but i do expect that the profits from our continued engagement in invading and reaping all of the benefits from the rest of the world while they clamor bells about how dangerous and authoritarian and evil russia and china are will instead of just going wholesale to ceos like the republican party was going to do will probably result in being suppressed back down to specifically the millennial working class and I think most millennials will take it. They'll label it socialism, so we'll take it. It'll be, you know, at some point, universal health care. It'll be a higher, you know, it'll be a living minimum wage. It'll be all these things to create a millennial middle class. And most of us will take it because we've been starving for so goddamn long. It'll be and the Bismarck response. The Bismarck response? So back during the 1880s and 1890s, uh, to combat socialism in Prussia, Otto von Bismarck basically ramped up the welfare state. And yeah, okay, right. And that so that is what I foresee coming in the future. And that's exactly what was done in the 60s. That's what Kennedy, that's what Johnson did. In a way, that's what Roosevelt did. But I mean, you know, we had people dying of starvation and half the crops in this country died. It was there were so many extraordinary circumstances that the government had no choice but to seriously go in a very far left direction. I mean, not far left as in like Soviet, but like left as this country could ever conceive of going. So I expect that that's what the future is going to be. I don't expect them to change much about the economy from Trump's decisions. I don't expect them to change uh, much of foreign policy from Trump's decisions. I expect them to put a new label on it and say that the age of Trump is dead and over. It'd be great if they would actually prosecute him, put him in jail. I'd, <laughs> honestly, it would be worth living in this future just to see that. Okay, Attica, I, I hate to bur burst your bubble on this one. What? Trump no, know, is not, not going up. to go to jail because there is already a precedent that has been set that he will be pardoned. This happened with Nixon. Yes, but he was pardoned by his vice president. I mean, that, I think, is probably a big motivation of why this case is taking so long. I mean, they probably want to get Pence out as well. But getting sidetracked from my main point. My main point is, you know, we're going to see a new middle class born out of a ramping up of a welfare state. And that tied with a, a not very much of a change in the organization of the economy. You know, the money's going to end up in a different pocket, but I don't think that like neoliberalism isn't dead. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to change. And I expect that we'll probably have a much worse crash in the future. And suddenly all those millennials living on that welfare state are going to remember why they were looking to communism as an answer at some point. And that's when we have to come in with our answer. This is happening, continuing to happen. Why? Be for this reason. And this is what we're going to do about it. So if that is the future that comes, then that means that even down to us three here on this podcast, the future lies with us in that moment, in the next crash, after, you know, liberals refuse to admit that anything is horribly wrong, make a temporary welfare state, quell the calls for rebellion and revolution, and glute people on all kinds of consumerism, that in the next crash we stand up and say, this is going to keep happening, it continues to keep happening. Now look, you've just lost all your homes because you got homes all on free credit that you took because you were so damn poor for so long and the welfare state 
that you had is now gone overnight. That certainly seems like a plausible scenario. Um, I'm not sure that I'm sold on the likelihood of it. Um, if only because I'm just going to go on a limb and say that the means by which the proletariat is kept down and is exploited and trampled, those means have become more sophisticated over time, just naturally because of you know the evolution of marketing, research, and you know political science, etc. So I almost wonder, you know, there's this uh, very ominous doubt in my mind that they need to launch that welfare state. The welfare state was obviously a response to rad rising radical sentiment, um, you know, and like its function overall, you know, whether intentional or not, um, its function was to prevent an uprising and to prevent the 60s, uh, you know, left movements from becoming something dangerous to the, you know, status quo. So. I almost wonder if it almost seems like the left these days is just less competent and less likely to actually go through with any action that has likelihood of success. And maybe that's also because of the more dominant intelligence and military presence or the it's imbalance they of power. killed most of us. Yeah, they that, that most too. Of us. By throughout <laughs> the 80s, they killed most of us. This generation has to relearn everything and reread everything and start from zero again. Yeah, that's there too. So, like, with it's so not that much we're not competent. Power. Well, I mean, yeah, we aren't competent, but that's because they killed all of us. No, for sure. But then does that lower competence mean that they don't really that the, the oligarchs are not going to re be required to have that welfare state, that, like, slightly less heinous society, you know? Or can they just continue and continue to exploit us more and more? Like, where where is, like, that balance shifted going to occur? You know, where is that transformation going to occur in the climate where we, instead of continuing to be exploited, actually stand back. And are there means of controlling us just so much more austere that they don't need that welfare state? That's, I guess, my only doubt. The other part that you have to consider here is that the alt-right is very competent in their talking points, as obnoxious as they are or may seem. It's just like right in front of this whole women's movement, they had the audacity to basically come up with this outrageous slogan, my borders, my choice, where they were comparing immigration to rape. They have had an engine. They have had 4chan for a decade and have produced their rhetoric down to a formula like a TV show episode form, like an anime formula. Again, you know why they like anime so much, it's formulatic. You know what's interesting though, is if you type in that slogan into Google, all the web forms come up where they all discuss, oh yeah, we're totally going to implement this particular slogan. Like you can actually see the the thought process going into it when yeah, you start researching organized. this like it is the left isn't organized we're not organized because we're poor as shit to answer reconciles point about the government more sophisticated i think it's less yeah the spy network the system the, the the collecting of information is not the efficient thing that they had in the 60s and 70s. They have too much information, they can't find and sort through the data to find what's actual real information that they can use. They have no usable information. Most of it's tied up behind companies that they then have to go and subpoena and get permission from. And, you know, companies sometimes say yes, sometimes they say no, it's dependent on what company, what ISP they use to access that company. And in the 60s, the state had a very powerful tool that could say to leftists, it, you know, if you shut up, you'll get to have a house and a wife and a car and a dog and a white picket fence, and then the 80s are going to happen. And you're going to get to have a whole bunch of money on big free credit, and the 90s are going to happen, and you're going to get to have a computer. But the state only has fear. The state is relying on fear and permanent anxiety to exist right now. And that that is a very much a tool of last resort. If they could have baited 
our generation into taking cars and homes and not actually asking for freedom, they would have. They might have the political power too soon after Trump, which is why I'm saying that will probably be the first thing they try to do. But they didn't. So far, they have not had that power. They have had the Republicans obstructing all the way. They have not had the power to bait the millennial generation, and they may not have even had the money to do it. I think that we are starting to see, though, the more violent aspects starting to come out because it's just every week or every other week, you just hear a new story when it comes to things like police brutality, where, for instance, like there was a case where a Louisiana teacher was drug out of a school board meeting for questioning a superintendent's raise. This crooked guy gave himself 30000 more dollars of the public money while lunchroom programs were going un- unfunded. Teachers weren't getting the supplies that they needed. Their, their classes had too many students in them. So just a whole just battery of things going on here that aren't being addressed. And the superintendent decides, I'm doing a good job. I'm going to give myself a raise. And then when somebody goes up to question them, what do they do? They have the police go in there and drag the woman out. Those are tools of last resort. And those tools are going to be turned around and used on the liberals who don't shut up and agree that everything is a Russian plot. And they're going to see, they're, they're going to get whacked by the club of the state that they fought for to get Trump out of and put another Democrat in. So given that these are tools of last resort, that reconsidering, reconcile may be right, that welfare state might not be coming because they just don't have the money, the power, the ability to generate it again. I don't think that they economically have the ability to generate the amount of credit that would re- be required to do so. I mean, you know, even if even if they forced all these companies to repatriate all this money, it, it wouldn't be there. But in the meantime, they want they- so bad for Trump and Russia to be the issue here. And it's not. They're, 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 they're symptoms of a wider problem that most of them refuse to engage with or understand. This is another reason, other than just winning as the left, this is another reason why we really need to adopt those malice tactics. Because as the state just runs out of fear, tools to use, and people stand up against them because it gets to the point where, you know, they they don't care if they're arrested, they can't keep watching their teachers get dragged away in handcuffs. I mean, really, if, if that teacher's students were in that room, do you not think that being teenagers who don't think i i could have seen that going much worse than it did and it just just wait until until one of these other companies that starts laying people off when they call the police on on workers when they start assembling outside of their former workplaces because we just saw with three big companies here recently promise their workers bonuses and then Right after that, lay them off. AT&T did it with 4,000 workers, Comcast 600. Walmart had the gall to go in there and basically fire 3,500 co-managers and then tell them, hey, you know what? We're going to replace you with assistant manager positions that are just under you. And if you like, you can apply for that job instead. And we'll just pay you less to do the same thing. Walmart's sister company, Sam's, laid off 9,500 employees by closing 63 stores and then converting others into online distribution centers. Obviously, these these tax benefits, they're not something that the average worker is going to see. And when people start figuring it out, when people start realizing, hey, you know, it's, it's not going to save their job by bootlicking. And then they finally do get angry and start organizing or protesting these companies. Well, then we already have the precedent where the police just comes out and beats people and shoots people. And people are going to sit there and there's going to be a segment of society, mostly alt-right, that are going to defend this action. Totally. And I think at this point, we're just waiting to see it happen because if we find it acceptable as a society, what happened to this teacher, then eventually we're going to, as a society, find it acceptable to do this to striking workers. And it's not like this is historically unprecedented. I don't think that it people find it acceptable. 
I think it's hard to find it in the news. I think only because of the severe amount, the fact that, like you said, it's happening every week, isn't even making the news. And when it makes the news, most sleeping liberals drop their donut and go, whoa, I didn't know that happened. The only reason it makes the news hardly anymore is because it was videotaped or because there's a kid involved. Like the whole thing in True. Ohio with the teen getting shot dead in court by police because of a physical altercation. One, that did not need the officer to pull his gun because the kid was unarmed. They could have used a taser, which I don't necessarily endorse. But hey, at least it's less lethal. He probably would not have died from it. But the police had to go for the gun and had to go for the kill shot every time yeah had to assert their dominance it, it can't continue i don't care how many left comms you have reading a book giving a reason why we weren't gonna work and we weren't gonna win this time this can't continue functionally this country cannot function like this this is a recipe for collapse we are watching the end of an empire collapse in real time they want to think it's all just trump and russia and it's not and unless we want to be victims of the next empire to come, then we have to do something. Those workers who are going to gather in front of their old workplace or whatever, who are going to get shot down and hosed down and arrested and beat up and gassed, they're likely mostly going to be liberals who had no idea that would happen. Aren't these my rights? Aren't these in the Constitution for me to assemble and protest? And why are the police here? I think it's important that there be leftists always there present saying, you're going to get beaten up, you're going to get gassed, you have to be willing to do that, and if you're willing to do that, you have to know what you want to get out of this. Right, and I live and in a mid- mostly the response is probably going to be, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Exactly, and I and live in a mid-sized city, and I remember that there was a protest, I'd say it's probably about a year ago, year six, I, I don't remember. Uh, exactly when it was i think it was right before the election there was a march downtown uh for the uh i believe it was the dakota pipeline thing is what they were protesting they had fucking snipers on the rooftops in a town of 150,000 people or so snipers on the rooftops monitoring unarmed protesters yeah, it's insane. I don't. I really don't get how this history of police brutality against protesters is so underwhelmingly covered, you know, liberal discourse. And honestly, shout out to those uh, individuals and media producers who managed to get this history recorded in their fiction or um, kind of spread that idea. Like uh, two things that come to mind, which did a really good job of that. Babylon 5, which had a really great episode on how corporations use police brutality or like private security to shut down protests night in the woods let's not forget about night in the woods if any i don't know if either of you have played that but that has a great uh a great discussion about how um labor is oppressed i've never played night in the woods and it sounds like i probably should there is a great yeah there, there is a great subplot i don't even know about subplot but an important theme which is this idea and i don't want to spoil anything uh, the game does talk about how labor is treated by police, and it's actually kind of incredible what echoes that those events have. But I don't know, I just felt like that was a good, uh, good furry tie-in. Well, I think that if people don't wake up soon, when they do wake up, it will be too late for them. Because, And history has shown oftentimes that is the case. Yeah, and we're really bad at being proactive about this kind of shit. <laughs> It just seems like right now, it seems so obvious, and but I don't see how people aren't getting, more people aren't getting involved. And I really hope that this does come to a head, that the issue's pushed before it becomes a massive problem. Because the longer this festers, the worse it's going to get. Like I said, this is this is unsustainable. A state that's only maintained by fear and violence and permanent anxiety at, within your own home cannot stand perpetually that there is an end to this 
Now, I actually uh, did want to uh, go over one last item today uh, with you guys as well uh, before we get going today. I understand that we're all on uh, Goat Halls slash Dionysus's uh, block list. Of course, you guys all Hell know about yeah, this. Hell yeah, we are. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it so- occupies none of my thought and none of my day. It was an exhilarating moment. When <laughs> How many I people are using it? it? Probably oh, not God. that many, but there's like 500 and something people on it. There are probably more people on it than use it probably but the funny thing is is like who all is on it because not only is it the predictable people attica me at reconcile caster but like fucking john mccain's on there and reason magazine (laughs) and like i i understand like he had to throw some right-wing people on there too to make it look legit but about two-thirds of it is leftists I mean, so let, let's be honest here. There is an obvious bias, but what I really want to know, Goat Hall, what did John McCain do? I, I, I'm just, obviously, this just seems so random. John, McC- really? Come on. <laughs> you should know that. I mean, I'm worried. I'm worried next time John McCain gets reelected if there's still a country, because I know that's like six years away. But, uh, Do you think John I mean, McCain the is Republican capable Party of... considers him a traitor. Like, it's been mostly because of him that Trump's attempts at repealing the Affordable Care Act and budgets and almost everything that he's done has been because John McCain and one other Republican voted no. So that's why he's on there. He's considered a traitor to Trump's will. Oh, okay. So the alt-right doesn't like him because he's not Nazi enough for their tastes. Or rather, because he's not a Nazi. Exactly. And with that, dear listeners, with the world in chaos, good night and good luck.